need to work together at different orders of government. Uh, we need to make sure we're there to support families because uh, getting a house into a home, building a strong future uh, for yourselves, for your kids, uh, should be something accessible to all families across this country. And more and more, it's just not. But we also know it's a complex problem without having any one simple solution and that's why we're moving forward and have been over the past years with many different programs and approaches uh, that are tailored to meet different needs across the country. In Budget 2022, we're focused on three main pillars, supply, savings and cutting down on speculation. Around supply, uh, we're going to work, as we have been, with partners like in, in municipalities to move forward on the Housing Accelerator Fund. And what this is is $4 billion uh, designed uh, to help cities and towns right across the country increase the supply of housing. We're also going to continue with an extremely successful program called the Rapid uh, Housing Initiative that has uh, allowed for thousands upon thousands of new homes and new, uh, new uh, properties to be built over the, uh, the past uh, couple of years uh, that will allow for thousands more very rapidly to ease off on some of the pressures that families are facing. We're also going to support with savings, and the big vehicle for that in Budget 2022 is a $40,000 uh, tax-free savings account for the purchase of a first home. Indigenous families and individuals will be moving into 30 units uh, that uh, are being built by the KW Urban Native Wigwam project in Cambridge. And we'll see women moving into over 40 units uh, at the YW partnership in the city of Kitchener that's happening. All of this is happening through the Rapid Housing Initiative. Budget 2022 once again listened to the voices of cities and communities and we're very appreciative as cities of the many investments that the federal government has made uh, with respect to, uh, to housing and as cities and communities we're ready to roll up our sleeves in order to get that money flowing and making a difference in the lives of, uh, of peoples in our community. So when the next phase of rapid housing initiative funding starts flowing we'll be ready as we were in the first two phases to get those units built. And we're certainly ready to work together with the federal government and the $4 billion in the Federal uh, Housing Accelerator Fund uh, with the goal of building 100,000 new units in the next five years. Uh, my son, 25 years old, still lives at home with us, college grad, good paying job. He laughs off the idea that he'll ever own a house, a detached house like the one he lives in now that we were able to afford 25 years ago. He just thinks it's a joke, the housing prices are ridiculous, there's no way he's ever going to be able to afford the kind of mortgage it would take crippling for life. So I want to ask your thoughts on that, those, uh, you know, people starting out in their 20s and early 30s. Uh, what do you say to them? Do you say give up on detached ownership and go for something smaller and it's a dream that's dead? You're never going to get there? Let me ask uh, how you feel about that. Uh Obviously, I've heard from uh, Canadians like your son uh, across the country who are really worried about the housing market, who wonder whether or not they'll ever be able to afford a home. One of the challenges we're facing in Canada is our population uh, with immigration uh, and other things has been growing over the past years and housing construction hasn't kept up. Uh, which uh, is a real problem and that's why one of the initiatives we're working on four billion dollars towards municipalities in order to double the construction of new housing over the coming years. Thank you too for welcoming me during the holy month of Ramadan. I know uh, with uh, uh, fasting and uh, reflections that you're having it's uh, difficult perhaps to pull together a big event like this last minute but it is uh, a deep privilege for me to be able to join with you in this month of reflection, of sacrifice, of thinking about how we are all connected and how we commit ourselves every day to serving to a better world. And that uh, is, makes it an appropriate time for us to gather. As we reflect on the past two years that we've had, I think there is reason for us to be celebrating uh, the fact that Canadians, not just in this community, but across the country, came together to support each other, to be there for each other through the difficult years of the pandemic. People made sacrifices, people stepped up to support each other, be there for neighbors, to be there for our most vulnerable, to be there uh, for, uh, for you know, our frontline health workers. And Canadians saw each other through this pandemic uh, better than anyone could have imagined. 
but it was still really difficult, particularly for you kids, who instead of being able to you know, go outside and play with friends the way you'd want to, instead of going to birthday parties and sleepovers, uh, you had to do your homework by the kitchen table, you had to do extra work to help out mom and dad when they were working at home. Uh, this was a difficult year, and all of you as kids made real sacrifices, and you are part of the reason why we got through this well, because you were great. So I want all the adults in the room to right now give a huge round of applause to all the amazing kids who are here. You guys, you guys are inspiring.